Well, good morning, everyone. And can I welcome you to church this morning? Uh, it's not a bad day outside. It's not raining, which is something. Uh, for the folk who are going to be watching the, uh, the video in, a, in an hour or so's time, I welcome them as well. Uh, today, today is a special day insofar as we've got Neville Cobe talking to us later on. If you can see at the front, there's a bit of a chemistry experiment which he'll, he'll do with the children. So Luke and Lucas and Hannah, it's going to be for you. Uh, and this is also uh, Mr. Beggs' uh, last official day as a minister. He retires, I suppose, at midnight tonight and goes into retirement tomorrow morning. And we'll be thinking about that in our prayers. I want to read a few verses from Psalm 146. And it goes as follows. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And we're going to, to sing now. We're going to sing Psalm 146. So there we go. Praise ye the Lord. sung our praise to God, so let us now be silent for a moment or two as we come before him in prayer. Let's pray. 
Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you now just in awe of your wonderful existence. We acknowledge your gratitude, your powerfulness, your compassion and your love for each member of this body and church this morning. In reality, however, we don't really deserve that love and compassion, but through our faith in you, we know that is what you want from each one of us. We gather as a congregation in McQuiston this morning, bringing with us our own loves and our own interests. We pray that over the next hour or so, we can place all those things aside and so allow your Holy Spirit to enter into our hearts and our minds and so that we can really worship you. Worship you through our, our hymns and our songs, our prayers and Bible readings, and by listening to what Neville will say to us later today. We know you really enjoy those hymns and prayers and thoughts through the presence of your son, Jesus Christ, and how he died for each one of us. We acknowledge his teachings and his sacrifice on a cross almost 2,000 years ago. May your Holy Spirit move amongst us now as we bring our worship to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to turn to the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. So join with me if you've got a Bible and a pew there. Uh, I'm not really sure what number it's on, about 630-odd. So if, if you have a look for that one. So it's 1 Kings chapter 17, starting at verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of, of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Amen. We're going, we're going to sing again. Uh, this time might be a bit more familiar to you. We're going to sing two pieces. The first one is Creation Sings the Father's Song, and the second is I Will Enter His Gates. So let's sing, Creation Sings the Father's Song.
to participate in this one? Do you want to do a bit of chemistry? Yeah. So first of all, I have a question for you. Oh, that's okay. We'll switch microphone. Again, testing. Yep, that, is that okay? Grand. So, question for you to begin with. Have you ever felt like you were being ignored? Yeah? Yes, fairly emphatic, Lucas, yeah. Um, you ever felt like you weren't getting enough attention? Yeah, all the time. So, whenever that's happened, what do you do? What would you do to try and get somebody's attention if you feel like you're being ignored? Be a pain? Yeah. Are you, are you a pain all the time? Or just when you want attention? So, well, let's, let's be fair to him. So, so you do something different when you got to want to get somebody's attention, yeah? So sometimes when I've asked peop people this, they might say, we'll do something naughty to get attention. Be a pain is maybe another example of that. Um, let's try and illustrate this now with a bit of a chemistry, first of all. But the question for you is, if God felt like he, he was being ignored by us. What do you think God would do? Oops, I think that's watching the alert. We'll open that up. If God was felt like he was being ignored by us, what do you think he would do to get our attention? Any ideas? Okay, well, hold that thought for the moment. What we're going to do is just mix up some... Do you know what this is? Table salt, yeah. And do you know what this is? Yeah, it's baking soda. Both different types of salt. We're going to try and mix them up with a bit of water and see what happens. Okay, so if you don't need very much, you want to take a spoon and take a little bit out of there. Okay. Sort of pop that in there. Okay, and I'll give you some water. Just take one of those, stir it in. I'll let you pour that in. Make up some, some baking soda. You can do the same with some table salt there. Oh, you can fill it up. You can fill it up fairly full. Take some of that, just a little bit, don't need too much. And then if you want to grab one of the waters there and stir that in. Yep, so stir really thoroughly now with this one of the spoons. Oops, that's okay, we'll count that, you got it. No, no. So what do you think is going to happen when we mix these two together? Any ideas? So let's give that a, a good stir. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to disintegrate, yeah? A few people asked me before the service whether I was going to blow up the church. Do you think that's going to happen? No, 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 no chance. No chance. Okay, you're fairly confident that's not going to happen. Okay, and I'm going to give you another cup here. You're going to do the next bit. When those two are dissolved, we're going to mix them together, see what happens. Okay, do you want to pour a little bit of that in here? Yep, that's good. And do you want to pour a little bit of the table salt in there? That's sodium chloride, bicarbonate of soda. So that's the one you have. You want to pour that in there. Do you see anything happening? No? Doesn't look like there's much happening? No. Yeah, I don't see anything special happening. Hmm. Should we try a different salt? Now, this is one potassium iodide. 
Now, it says on this one, keep out of reach of children, so I've pre-dissolved some of it. You don't have to do that one. So there is some potassium iodide in here. I've got to take one of these and stir that in. Let's see if anything special happens. I'm going to give that a good stir. Do you see anything happening yet? No. Well, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it? No explosions. I don't see anything special happening. How about if you try mixing it into your one? Now, what colour is that? It doesn't look like there's any colour to it, no. Do you want to try mixing that one in there? Do you see anything special happening? Not really. No, no. There's a saying that's sometimes attributed to Albert Einstein, sometimes to Benjamin Franklin, that says that, that, that defines insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and getting different and expecting different results. And sometimes you might wonder when you're mixing colorless liquids of salts together and you don't see anything special happening, is that an example of insanity here? A bit disappointing, yeah. No, we don't see anything special there at all. How about if you pour it into one of these bottles? Do you think anything special might happen? Should we try that? Yeah. So that's a little bit tricky. We'll pour it in here. No, no, it's still a colorless liquid. So one more try. We'll try with a different salt here. And what I'm going to do is put on some gloves for this bit because this particular salt is different and it's poisonous, so I'm not going to let you handle this one. So, but first of all, I'll get you to pour some of these liquids in here now. So do you want to pour some of those into this bottle so everyone can see clearly? So this one that says KI on it, potassium iodide. Do you want to pour that in there? Yep, pour it into that. We'll add some water as well. I'll hold it steady. There we go. Pour that in the top. Okay. Maybe a little bit more. Plenty of this. So what colour is that? Does it have any colour to it really? Transparent, yeah. Yellow. Slightly yellow tint, maybe, but it's really transparent. And this one, different type of salt again. Pour that in there. Pour it, whoops, that in there so everyone can see. There we go. Oops, that's the wrong top. Okay. So, yeah, maybe a slight yellow tint. Okay, so now we're going to pour these into this salt down here. Oh. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing? Nothing? Nothing, no. Nothing special? Okay, let's have a look and see. What does that look like? Yep, yeah, it's white. It's white. It's white, like white paint. It's like we made white paint. Yeah. Let's try another one. We'll keep the lid on that. Don't open that one. What do you think is going to happen with this one? Could be right. Do you want to see? Yeah. So, usually, the take home message of this, usually when you mix different colorless liquids of salts together, you don't see anything special happening, do you? We don't, at least it doesn't look special to us. But when we mix some salts together, you get what's called a precipitation reaction. So you get this really colorful compound being produced like this bright yellow. Similarly, when God is active in the world usually, we don't, we're usually so used to the way God is acting through the things that he's made in his creation. And we sang in one of our last songs how creation sings God's praise. But sometimes we don't always notice it because we're used to it. Sometimes when God wants to act in a special way, he does what we call a miracle, something that grabs our attention, maybe even more dramatic, in fact, usually more dramatic than just color, colored liquids appearing when you mix salts together. So God sometimes acts in different ways, but he's still active all the time in the world that he's made. Let's think about this as we pray together. So arms out, wriggle your fingers, clap your hands over your head, Bring your hands past your eyes and let's talk to God. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, 
we thank you for how you are always active in our world, how we can glimpse your power through the beauty of everything you have made in this world, through all of your creation. Help us always to trust in you. We thank you also for those special times when you've grabbed our attention by performing miracles, especially through Jesus. Guide us by your spirit that we might always praise you, both in the ordinary and the extraordinary things that you do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing together, recognizing how God always is active in the world, how he's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> I think we need a bit of a rest after that. I'll uh, have some announcements, so if you want to take a listen to this. Messy Church, it's coming up uh, in a few weeks' time, first week in September. Uh, Paula McKeown, who's just left us, she has asked me to ask if, for the people who have volunteered to help out at Messy Church, if they could keep Tuesday the 23rd and Tuesday the 30th of August free to, to attend some training sessions here in the church hall. So it's Tuesday the 23rd and Tuesday the 30th of August. A couple of notes for your diaries there. And then the Pulse magazine. All articles are due to be with myself by Sunday the 14th of August. So that's a wee bit of notice. It's about two weeks away. This will allow us to get everything printed up by the end of August and get the magazine delivered to each of your homes. And then for Children's Church... If there's any other children, I, don't think I think they're all out at the back now, which is good. There's some resources out there, and they can work away reasonably quietly at the back there. And then next Sunday, we welcome the Reverend Richard McElhatton, not only as a minister to come and talk to us at our service, but as a new convener of the vacancy. So his name is Richard McElhatton. He's from Christ Church at Dundonald. He actually starts tomorrow, which is Monday the 1st of August, and he'll be with us next Sunday to declare the vacancy and start guiding us through this time of vacancy. And I suppose what I would like to say to you is try to make a, a special effort to come out next Sunday, initially to meet Richard and hear what he's got to say, and he'll be with us for a number of months until we get a new minister here. So those are all the announcements. We're now going to spend some time in, to pray for things that will affect us over the next period. We've got to pray for our church. We've got to pray for the wider Presbyterian church and the ongoing situation in our province. So let us now come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer, knowing that we can put things into simple words yet you will know the importance of each and every one of those words. We remember this day as the last day of the Reverend Beggs' ministry with us. We acknowledge everything Robert has done in this place over the past 21 years, those good things and those things which we've had to leave aside. We pray now for Robert and his wife, Karen, as together they start to make their own arrangements for the future. And Lord, just as that story concludes, 
we pray for the Reverend Richard McElhadden as our convener of the vacancy. Richard starts tomorrow, and with that we pray for his patience with us as he guides us the, through the way of our vacancy. There will be forms to complete and various meetings which we'll have to have with the presbytery and the central church. May together we will complete those things and in due course start looking for a new minister. We pray that our Kirk session will come together and produce a vision document to guide us into 2023 and beyond. I pray for our Kirk session as they together decide upon a new clerk for our session. This is an important role for someone to fulfill and guide our session, our committee, and the congregation through the future. I and we pray that someone in God's will will come forward and we can get things moving. We acknowledge the work of those people in Presbyterian churches who are designated persons with the responsibility for the safeguarding of children and adults with a learning disability. Within McQuiston, we specifically pray for Kenneth Ray and Linda Ray, as together they can fulfill all the duties required, including a child protection policy, anti-bullying policy, and all the training courses which people must attend. We pray for both of them as they manage to do their own jobs within society, the church, and still find time to do this additional duty. Heavenly Father, we finally want to pray for our province of Northern Ireland. Our politicians still remain somewhat idle up at Stormont. So Lord, we, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to move inside each and every one of them so that in due course they may come together and to form a government and start to get things sorted. We pray for their civil servants who are still managing to get some things completed without ministerial approval. Be with each and every one of them as they endeavor to keep our country afloat. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We again turn to God's word and our second Bible reading is Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 17 and it's on page 135 of the New Testament. So it's Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 17 and it's entitled Jesus Raises a Widow's Son. Soon afterward Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the, loss, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared amongst us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again. Uh, another newish one, Praise is Rising. So let's stand and sing.
let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I would like you to try, if you can, and use your imaginations. Imagine you were in Maine at the scene of the, of, of, of the events that were described in the gospel reading that John read for us earlier this morning. Maybe you try and imagine the atmosphere. Maybe it's a hot and dusty day. You've experienced a few of those this summer. And imagine you're just positioned just outside the gates of the city. Over on the horizon, you can see a crowd approaching surrounding a figure who you may not recognize, you may not have seen before, various followers. And then coming out of the gates of the city, you see another crowd. This time it's a funeral procession. And there are people wailing, maybe paid mourners. There is a mother who is grieving. She's a widow. The person being carried out on a stretcher, a beer, an open coffin, is her only son. She's probably lost the only means of support that she had in her family. We don't know the age of her son. He's addressed as a young man. Could be a wide range of ages, but potentially he could have been the only breadwinner in the family after she was widowed. So you then see this other crowd on the horizon coming close, being led by this figure. And wait, what's he doing? He's coming right up to the coffin where the dead body is and touching it. Does he not realize that's going to make him ritually unclean? Now, who are you looking at? Do you look at the mother, the widow? whose son was dead, is now alive. Can you imagine what thoughts are going through her head at this time? Do you look at the person who's visiting this town, Maine? It's Jesus, of course. Do you look at him? Do you look at the son who was dead and is now alive? What do you think he's thinking? Maybe wondering, should I switch this one? Okay. Does that sound better? Oh, yes, definitely. So look at the, the son. What do you think he's thinking? I mean, he was dead. At that point, he probably wasn't thinking anything. Now he's suddenly alive, and now everybody's staring at him, maybe thinking, what am I doing here? What's happening? Why is everyone looking at me? See, the thing is, things like this don't happen every day. I mean, has anybody here ever been to a funeral where a dead person has come to life again? Probably not. These are unusual, extraordinary events. And as I explained with the children, sometimes God acts in extraordinary ways to grab our attention, to alert us to something really special. It's something we would describe as a miracle. We would describe it as a miracle. Now, to define a miracle, however, is not always straightforward. For the sake of argument, and there are problems with this definition, as I'll get into later, but for the sake of argument, for the time being, we can define a miracle in the same way that the um, Scottish atheistic philosopher based in Edinburgh of the so-called Enlightenment, John, uh, David Hume, described a miracle. David Hume described it in these terms. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature and is a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws. The proof against a miracle, by the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. So Hume defines a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature. Now, there are problems in terms of Hume's definition, but if, if we take this for the time being, a violation of the laws of nature, what, first of all, are the laws of nature in themselves? merely descriptions of what we usually observe happening in the natural world. An English clergyman of the 1800s, author of The Water Babies, a work of fiction, Charles Kingsley, described the miracles as the customs of God. 
how God normally operates in the natural world. And I think this is a good way to understand the laws of nature. But if we're to take violations of the laws of nature, how often do we see these in the Bible itself? Never mind our own everyday experience. How often do we see them? Well, miracles in the Bible, as you can see up on the screen there, are usually described by different words. Not just these words, there are other words used, but in the Old Testament particularly, we have the words being used, otot umufetum. An ot is a sign, a mofet is a wonder. Otot umufetum. We find this, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 22, when we, the children of Israel are being reminded how God has performed otot umufetum, signs and wonders. Again, we find this reflected in the New Testament. Jesus cautions people in John chapter 4, verse 48, he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Samaya kaitalata, signs and wonders in Greek, again. Sometimes people might be false prophets performing signs and wonders. In Matthew 24, verse 24, we have Jesus warning people against false prophets performing Samaya Megala, great signs, kaitarata, and wonders. And when Peter is addressing the crowd at Pentecost in Acts chapter, 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he describes how Jesus was a man attested, accredited to God to you by mighty acts, wonders, and signs. Dunamesi, kaitarasi, kaisamaios. Dunamesi, think of it like dynamite, something explosive, something that really grabs our attention. Tarasi, again, it's wonders and samayo, signs. So we're dealing with things that are not merely a spectacle, but something that points specifically to God acting in a special way. A sign and a wonder. Two things put together. This, there are other words sometimes used in our translations reflected as miracles. Erga in John's Gospel are works that Jesus performs. But these are the words we usually encounter to describe the miraculous. So they have a purpose. It's a wonder that grabs our attention, but it's a sign that points very specifically to God acting in a particular way. Now, if we're to go through the pages of the Bible, we'll find signs and wonders aren't evenly distributed. They were particularly associated, as I've mentioned earlier, referencing Deuteronomy, with Moses, and also with his successor, with Joshua. We've heard an example of a dead person being rise, raised, to de raised from the death um, in 1 Kings chapter 17, performed by Elijah. Lots of signs and wonders are associated with Elijah, and also his successor, Elisha, both raised people from death. Now, David Hume, in his chapter on miracles, in his inquiry concerning human understanding, admits that for him, it would be a miracle if a dead person came back to life. That's one of his key definitions of a miracle. He defines it as such because he thinks nobody's ever observed this. But we have testimony of this, certainly in the Bible. We have three examples of resurrection miracles throughout the Old Testament. We've heard about Elijah raising the widow of Zarephath's son, Elisha raises the Shunammite wo woman's son, and also then Elijah, sorry, Elisha, when he's dead, his, somebody falls into his grave and his bones, contact with his bones brings somebody back to life. So those are three resurrection miracles occurring throughout the Old Testament. Not that many. Violations of the laws of nature, if we're to think through all of the different prophets of the Old Testament, many of them don't have any that we would define in that way. So we're to think of Ezra, Nehemiah, any violations of the laws of nature there? How about in Esther? How about in Job? How about in Malachi, Nahum, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel? I mean, certainly remarkable visions and prophecies there, but do we have violations of the laws of nature? So they're not evenly distributed. Isaiah, yes, we do have one miracle particularly associated with King Hezekiah, with the shadow appearing to reverse its direction, but they're not 
evenly distributed, mainly associated with Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha throughout the Old Testament. And when we come to the New Testament, of course, then we have a spectacular quantity of miracles being performed by Jesus. The question is, why do we not see them more often? The Anglican clergyman, late Anglican clergyman and theoretical physicist, Sir John Polkinghorne, described how the problem for us with the miracle isn't a scientific problem. Really, it's not a scientific problem. It's a theological problem concerning the consistency of divine action. Why does God do something in some circumstances and not in others? Or as John Polkinghorne put it in something of a caricature, it sometimes might seem to people that God does something today that he didn't think of doing yesterday and couldn't be bothered to do tomorrow. Well, obviously, that's not the case, and that's not what John Polkinghorne himself thought. And writing in one of his books, he described how miracles are not arbitrary divine actions, but rather events of deep disclosure. Signs and wonders, utot umufetem, samaya kaitarata, signs of God's activity, events of deep disclosure, but also that they make us wonder. This is what we're dealing with here. Now, resurrection miracles in the New Testament, we have more. We have six, double the quantity in the Old Testament, four associated with Jesus. And I'll make it clear at this point, I'm not dealing with Jesus' own resurrection from the dead which is unique, which is the first fruits of the hope of all that we all have. The difference is with Jesus' resurrection body, it has different qualities. He can appear in a room where the, where the doors are locked. Sometimes people don't immediately recognize him, maybe he has some control over his appearance. His resurrection body has a different quality. But if we're dealing with people who were raised from dead, raised from death and yet were still mortal, we have six examples in the New Testament, four associated with Jesus. We've heard about Jesus raising the widow of Nain's son. Lazarus, of course, will be a well-known example. Jairus' daughter will be another. And uniquely at the end of Matthew's gospel, a number of people at the point when Jesus dies rise from their graves and enter Jerusalem, the holy city, as Matthew describes. So four examples associated with Jesus, and two in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter raises Tabitha, or Dorcas, from death, and Paul raises Eutychus. But these things are not evenly distributed throughout all of the Bible. So if we're to think about how God is acting in our world normally, Let's go back to Psalm 146. Psalm 146 encourages us to praise God by pointing to numerous examples of God's activity. It describes how God is the creator of everything. In verse 6, he made heaven and earth, the seas and all that are in them. And then it goes on to say, Hashomer emet le'olam. He keeps truth forever. He is faithful forever. God is faithful forever. We can see this reflected in laws of nature, the regularities, the customs of God, as Kingsley put it. God is faithful in that way, among many other ways. We have a list then going on in the ensuing verses of God's activity. Only one of them we might arguably describe as a violation of the laws of nature. So, for example, we hear how God opens the blind. Adonai pokeok ivrim, opens the eyes of the blind. That's probably the only one we might think of as a violation of the laws of nature. But what about how God sets the prisoner free? How God loves the righteous, how God lifts up those who are bowed down, Adonai Zokef Kefufim, he lifts up those who are bowed down, how God looks after the sojourner, the refugee, Hashomer, Adonai Shomer et Garim. He looks after the refugee, the sojourner. 
these could be things that we could see God's activity acting through other people. Not necessarily direct activity of God in a way that we might describe as miraculous, but God acting through us as well in different ways. So we have all these descriptions. But again, the question, why does God perform signs and wonders that grab our attention under some circumstances, but not others? Well, if we're going to go to the end of Matthew chapter 13, we have one instance where Jesus doesn't perform signs and wonders. It's in his hometown of Nazareth. He doesn't perform many mighty acts there. And why? Because of their apistia, their lack of faith, their unbelief, complete lack of belief. Mark, in his parallel account, is somewhat amusing because he describes how Jesus doesn't perform many signs and wonders, or any signs and wonders there, except lay his hands on a few people and heal them, as if that's not miraculous enough already. So, where people lack belief somehow, Jesus does not perform as many miraculous signs. Now, the account we heard of Jesus raising the widow of Nain's son immediately follows on Jesus healing a centurion's servant from a distance at the beginning of Luke chapter 7. And Jesus describes there how he hasn't seen such faith in in, in Israel, but it's expressed here by a Gentile who's not willing to have Jesus even come into under his roof and just ask him to heal at a distance. So faith is clearly a motivator for Jesus performing miraculous healings. Again, if we're to go to chapter 12 of the Gospel according to Matthew, there's a request from the Pharisees to perform a sign. They say in verse 38, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And Jesus doesn't agree with this. He doesn't comply. He says, A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. The only sign you will have is the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So a lack of belief definitely seems to contraindicate Jesus performing signs and wonders. And it's not surprising that Jesus wouldn't comply with this request. People are attributing Jesus' casting out of demons to Beelzebul, the prince of demons, falsely attributing the signs and wonders that he performs to demonic causes. So if faith is a motivator, then what about this example in Luke chapter 7 of the widow of Nain's son? Whose faith motivates Jesus there? Is it the widow? I don't think she was expecting this. Jesus says to her, don't weep. But there's no sign if if she's already weeping, mourning her son, that she's expecting Jesus to raise her son from from death, from the dead. What about the crowd? No sign of them having a faith in, in advance. They certainly expressed a strong faith afterwards. We read in verse 17 how the word of what Jesus had done sp- spread throughout the whole area of Judea and the surrounding countryside. What about her son? Well, he's dead. He can't do anything. It's not because of his faith. So what's motivating Jesus in this instance? Well, I think the answer is obvious. It must be just only Jesus' compassion. His heart went out to her, to the widow, as, as the NIV renders it. Jesus had compassion on her that was deep within, deep within the, the guts, gets across the, the, stre- the, the element of the Greek here. He has compassion on her that her heart, his heart goes out to her. Now, we may not fully understand why Jesus healed in some circumstances, but not others. Faith was clearly a motivator, but also compassion. And the consequence of this was faith. Word of Jesus spread, and people describe Jesus as a great prophet. They even say God has visited his people. God has shown favor on his people. But does that mean they necessarily recognize Jesus as God at this point? Probably not. 
The same wording of God visiting his people is used by Zechariah at the birth of John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So they're recognizing God's action here, but maybe not recognizing it fully in who Jesus is. But Luke does. Luke does in a remarkable way. In this passage, for the first time in Luke's gospel, he uses the title, Hukurios, the Lord, to, to describe Jesus. The Lord. Now, what's interesting about this? Well, if ever a faithful Jew is reading the Hebrew scriptures and they come across God's name, represented by four letters, yod Hey vav Hey. They don't pronounce it. They say the Hebrew word Adonai, Lord, instead. Kyrios in Greek corresponds to Adonai in Hebrew. Luke, at this point, is recognizing Jesus as equivalent with God when he is describing him as Ho Kyrios, the Lord, associated particularly with this miracle of raising somebody from death. Paul, when he is writing to the Romans, associates this power to raise somebody from death with God's creative power. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, he describes God who gives life to the, death, to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were or calls things not yet existing into existence. God who can create out of nothing can raise the dead to life. So the consequence of this is remarkable faith. but we don't see this all the time. As Psalm 146 describes, there were various reflections of God's activity. Not all of them might be described as miraculous, not all of them will be signs and wonders, but it's still God's activity. Whether he lifts up those who are bowed down, when he looks after the orphan and the widow, the refugee, when God loves those who are righteous in their behavior, when God gives food to the hungry. These could be ways in which God acts through each of us as well as acting directly. When I think about this, I often think of words that are usually attributed to Teresa of Avila, the Carmelite reformer. Who in her writings, it's alleged she said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes with which Christ looks with compassion out on the world. Yours are the feet by which he goes about doing good. Yours are the hands by which he blesses us now. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. And this makes sense when we think of our risen and ascended Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father, who's no longer bodily present with us, but certainly present through the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit motivating each of us to act on his behalf. And so as we think about signs and wonders, how can we, through our actions, moved by God's Spirit, and also by our words, be a sign to other people, pointing them towards Jesus and a way that makes them wonder, how is God acting in the world? How has he acted historically? God who alone can raise the dead, who came down to find us, who came down to save, who can lift us from the grave. Let us reflect these words as we give him the praise and let us try and think of the ways that we can point to him in our words and our deeds throughout the coming week. Let us reflect this as we sing our closing hymn together, Who Alone Can Save.
Finally, a benediction. Let us turn to each other and say the words of the grace to each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.